Guys, you're in for a treat. Those that attended earlier this morning, you had an opportunity just to get a feel for the expertise that you're going to listen to tonight. Not only share their experiences, but also their insights to help you build a better pathway towards whatever your desires may be. And I could not have been blessed with a better group of colleagues. And so there's a saying that if you want to go, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. Tonight we're going to go together and we're going to basically understand what it took to help these folks, this group of leaders, get to where they need to be. And they're also going to share those things with you. So we'll talk about how you need to know your strengths, understanding your audience, understanding your brand, and then we'll close with building your purpose. And then we'll have a Q&A panel. But without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Scott Davis. Dr. Davis, he teaches at the University of Houston. MBA marketing class. I have the pleasure of teaching with him as a corporate fellow. And I will tell you that he's brilliant. And anyone familiar with LinkedIn? Right, and everyone's familiar with Excel, right? Does anyone use Excel at its full capability? I don't think no one does. But it is, has, it's a vast opportunity of tools. But this gentleman knows LinkedIn like nobody's business but he's going to be able to talk to you about knowing your strengths. And without any further ado, I'd like to introduce, let's give him a round of robust applause for Mr. <laughs> Scott Davis. Scott. I need to lower this considerably. Let's see. <laughs> All right. Can we switch the, the presentation out? So uh, it's, it's really an honor to be here at Morningside College. Cleo is without hyperbole, the best person that I know in the business world. So anytime I have the opportunity to work with Clio, it's just a beautiful experience. And the, uh, the weird thing tonight is going to be, since we teach classes together, for me to talk without Clio jumping in and saying, actually, hey, in the real world, it works like this, because I come at things from the more academic perspective. So maybe you will jump in. Who knows? Right? <laughs> but, um, but I am, as Clio mentioned, I'm going to be talking about knowing your strengths I think that um, my academic research is kind of shifting in this direction of personal branding and, and thinking about uh, your strengths and knowing yourself and how to market yourself in the job market. And one of the real weaknesses that I discovered when I started in the, the University of Houston system was preparation for the job market. And since I teach marketing, I kind of made it my own charge to better equip our students for marketing themselves because we're all salespeople in some sense. If you've ever been on a date, right, it's, it's personal selling. And it's the same way you should approach the job market. You are always selling. So um, I, I, I have a lot of passion about this. So if this works, kind of. This is what happens when I add animations into, oh, it really isn't working. I was joking. There we go. I was going backwards. So the, the quote I want to start you off with is, is one of my favorite quotes from Benjamin Franklin. So there are three things that are extremely hard. Steal, a diamond, and knowing yourself. And I think that is especially true when you're in college because you're just overwhelmed with information and you're trying to take in everything from your discipline, your electives, your personal life. And it's really difficult to be intentional about getting to know more about yourself. So sometimes what happens, and what happened to me in my own life, is that we become fixated on this path that we feel like we should be on, and at some point you can feel stuck in that path. And like there's almost nothing you can do to get off course. And for me, from a very early age, I was involved in computer programming. So my, my dad was a DuPonter, so I was born in Clinton, Iowa. This is the first time I've been back in Iowa since 1980. So this is kind of, kind of exciting for me. Um, but we had a computer in the home. Everyone does now, I guess, but at an early age. So I had that advantage of being able to pick up programming languages. And I programmed and programmed and, and built little games and things like that all through elementary school, junior high, and high school. And I just felt like that was almost my fate. Like I had to work in IT. I had to be a programmer. But once I actually got out there in my career, I realized I'm good at programming, but I hate it. 
And I realized something has to change because that was when I had that kind of aha moment that our strengths are not necessarily the things that we're good at, which seems counterintuitive. So the strengths are things that ignite a fire in us, things that we're passionate about. Because if you just fixate on things you're good at, but you don't enjoy, that's kind of a path to misery in life. So that's, that's going to be the, the, the focus of my talk tonight. So once upon a time, I kind of cut my teeth in my career in the happiest place on earth, which is what? Wilmington, Delaware. Yes, I heard it. <laughs> so Wilmington, Delaware. <laughs> so I, I grew up in Delaware, and this is where <laughs> I began my journey. I started my IT career in high school. I went to the University of Delaware to study computer science. That transition from high school to college was very difficult for me, and I had a really hard time my first year in school. And something kind of serendipitous happened to me. I was walking home from bowling practice, of all things, and I saw a poster on a wooden telephone pole that there was an informational session for a Walt Disney World college program. And the funny thing about the poster was that it was that night. So what I ended up doing was I took probably 40 pounds of bowling equipment and I walked over to the business school and I attended this informational session. What I didn't realize was that they were interviewing that night. So I'm there in my sweat-stained bowling shirt interviewing for you know, a job with this company that I would have dreamed of working for. And amazingly, I was offered one of those internships. And this working at Disney my cheesy Mickey Mouse slide, right? I'm like, I'm diehard still, 20 years later, you know, I'm still, still so into Disney and the brand and the things that, that they instilled in me. Um, one interesting thing about Disney, too, is I've worked a lot of jobs since I left Walt Disney World. Even if I'm interviewing for an academic position or if someone's visiting and they want to talk to me about my career, the first thing they see on my LinkedIn or on my resume is Walt Disney World. And like, oh, what's that like, right? What was it like to work there? And th this idea that I started with, that I felt stuck in IT, it was something that um, I had built up and my parents kind of pushed me toward pursuing a, an IT career because they had some uh, decent paying jobs and it was, it was what I already had some competencies in. What I realized when I was at Walt Disney World was there was a, a whole different world of career paths out there. And it was a really eye-opening experience for me because I got to work with all the theme parks, I got to work with Disney weddings and these groups that, and Disney known for their, their sales and marketing. So it really ignited a new passion in me. And what I found was that, and what I would have considered strengths, computer programming, that's not a strength, right? A strength is something you can probably apply to any job that you're ever going to work in. So I started to think about uh, being more deliberate in trying to kind of tip the balance of my career toward the activities I enjoyed doing versus the ones that I dreaded. Because I was just, uh, I loved the front end of an IT project. The ideation, you know, coming up with the new idea, you know, kind of specking it out, building maybe the, the prototype. But then there's a year of debugging, validation, verification, all these tasks that I absolutely dreaded. So I realized that I needed to do something either much different in the IT field or I needed to make a radical change in my career. So I won't, I won't bore you with my career ladder here, but it's a, a little bit unconventional because I had a lot of stops and starts in my career, mostly attributable to this uh, idea that I always had to get back to the world of IT. So after Walt Disney World, while I was, I, I came back to Delaware, finished my degree, and I ended up being the operations manager at a web hosting company. And it was the same thing. I really liked the front end of every project, but the day-to-day -day grind was just something that it didn't, it didn't lend itself to my strengths. Uh, after I graduated from the University of Delaware, I went to work at NASA Langley, and I liked to work on the really cool projects, like simulations for the Mars rover, but the daily tasks, the daily programming, things like that, I needed to be working at the strategic level, something that was a little, a little higher order, and I think that, that that's an actual strength of mine, strategy, being strategic, and the IT daily programming wasn't, wasn't built, helping me build toward that strength. I worked on a lot of uh, defense contracts. 
then this was the biggest change in my life, and um, my wife still talks about this all the time because she was very supportive while I went back to school for seven years to find myself. Uh, so I thought that maybe I can go back and get my MBA, and then instead of being a programmer, I can manage programmers. And what I quickly learned being amongst my MBA peers as someone who was a little bit introverted, not that you can't be a good manager when you're introverted, but I quickly learned management was not the right path for me either. Management and administration didn't really mesh with my own personal strengths. Uh, so I met a lot of fantastic marketing professors in that MBA program who inspired me to follow that passion that was seeded during that uh, stint that I had at Walt Disney World, and I went after my PhD in marketing. And now I'm a professor and I get to work with people like Cleo Franklin and the students at, at University of Houston downtown, you know, students who are uh, very much like many of you in the audience today, and, and that's helping me build on my, my strengths and my passions. So um, I, I really love this quote from Sean Anker, that success orbits happiness, not the other way around. And I think often we have that backwards in our society. We think that if we can build success, something that I would certainly be able to do in the IT field, that we'll be happy as a result. But that's not true. When you find your strengths, find your passions, build a career around that, the happiness will come, right? Or the success will come based on that happiness that you've, uh, you've built your life around. Another fixation that we have in our society, and uh, especially the younger members of our audience this will, this will resonate with, is we're fixated on weakness fixing. And I experienced this all throughout my schooling. The subjects where I was weak, when I brought home a C on my report card, or in, in junior high a D on my report card, everything was focused on, yeah, if you told me I was gonna be a professor when I was getting C's and D's in, in junior high, I would have thought you were absolutely out of your mind. But uh, everything was on weakness fixing. And what I learned later on in life and in my career is that if we focus 80% of our energy on fixing our weaknesses, your whole life is a remedial math lesson, right? So, and, that, and that's not fun at all. It's much more fulfilling to recognize your failures, partner with people who are strong where you're weak so that you can bring yourself up, get up to that base level that you have to be in, uh, in areas where you're having trouble, but focus most of your attention, the majority of your attention, on areas where you're passionate, areas where you're strong. So I mentioned earlier that uh, I really like the front end of programming projects. So one thing that I learned as I got into academia was that ideation is a strength of mine. And one thing that's really interesting about teaching with Clio is it's a strength of Clio's too. So before the semester starts, we have a thousand ideas and then it's just a question of how many we actually implement. Uh, but, but the interesting thing is when you're very introspective, um, try to be cognizant of activities that kind of put you in a flow state. Do you ever take a class or do something at work or do a task at home and you just kind of lose track of time, you lose track of yourself and you're just totally engaged with that task? Take some notes on that because that's your strength. That's where your passion is. And a, a really useful exercise, uh, there are assessments that you can take, of course. You can take a host of personality tests. You can take uh, the Clifton Strengths Finder assessment. But I found the most effective exercise is to just carry a journal around, well, probably your cell phone, but keep a journal on your cell phone for a week and record. These are the activities that I did today. This is what energized me. This is what drained me. And you'll very quickly be able to identify your strengths and weaknesses. Anything that drains you, you, you get home and you just feel like, wow, I need two hours to decompress from this, that's probably a weakness. Anything that's, gosh, that was fun. I can't wait to do that again. You know, when can I get this on my calendar again? That's your strength. And these are going to give you clues about the types of things you need to be working toward in your life and career. And uh, it's... It's also a lot of fun to do, to, to track these type of activities. Another important aspect here is that strengths, when they're not developed, when you don't invest in your strengths, they kind of had, have a shadow side to them. So I mentioned ideation, Cleo and I coming up with all these ideas. That can become a problem in your career if you're just constantly throwing ideas at people and never doing anything about it. So once you recognize what are my talents, what have I developed as strengths, you know, now how do I manage myself? That becomes very important. So as an academic now involved in research, instead of just coming up with a new research idea every day and not implementing on it, I, I keep an idea file. 
So on my computer, I just have a file with all the ideas that I've come up with over the, you know, now it's like the last seven years. And I'll just go through every now and then and, and pick an idea that I think is promising and start to develop it and see where it goes. If I didn't manage that strength, I think I would just be scatterbrained, absent-minded, and never getting anything done. So once you recognize this is what brings me passion, be very intentional, very deliberate about managing that, that talent and that strength. Ultimately, after you have a better knowledge of yourself, you understand what you're passionate about, you understand your strengths, you'll be better at picking up knowledge about other people, too. You'll become more perceptive about other people's strengths. Then you'll learn to manage yourself, and finally, in a leadership sense, you'll be able to manage others more effectively. Now, this little exercise, as an introvert, I recognize this is not going to be for everybody, but, you know, please humor me on this. Uh, so just kind of a, a window into how you might recognize things that are strengths for you. So I'm going to ask you to stand up. If you're somebody who likes to talk to people in elevators, on airplanes, maybe even bathrooms, or raise your hand if you, if, if you don't want to stand, it's fine. All right, so we would call that a strength, right? This is, this is a strength. I... I'm going to be honest, I have strengths envy, and this is the number one strength that I envy. And we would probably call this something like woo. And if you're going to be in leadership, in management, in sales, this is something that can serve you across a multitude of careers. Are you someone who plans ahead to anticipate problems? Yeah? Yeah, just keep standing. This is like an exercise session, right? So you're someone who's deliberative, right? This is another strength. And what you end up doing when you start to recognize activities like this, you'll realize that your combination of strengths is unique. You're not like anybody else. So if you understand what are your top three strengths, what are your top five strengths, how do they complement each other, that's when you can be a really powerful and effective leader. Are you someone who sees the potential in others? We can just raise our hands if you're tired of standing, right? <laughs> All right, so maybe you're developers. You're very good at developing other people. Are you someone who likes to make lists of things to do? This is at the bottom of my list of strengths, by the way. You might call this a weakness for me, right? So you have discipline. And then you can kind of start to get fine-grained with this. Do you make lists of things to do on weekends, the people with discipline? Yeah? When you're on vacation, right, you can kind of figure out how intense you get with with these particular strengths. This is a good one. So if you ever want to be in the C-suite, you'll see, you'll see quite a bit of this. Are you someone who feels comfortable taking charge? Good, a lot of people in here. And this is one of the rarer strengths. You have command, right? Command can be very powerful, but as I mentioned, ideation has a shadow side. Command certainly has a shadow side too in terms of um, being able to build relationships with, with other people. I just have a few more. Are you someone who feels the need to pick someone to race when you're on the freeway? Right? I notice traffic's not bad here, so I think there are some opportunities if you have snow tires. Right? Competition. Competition certainly can be a strength. Cleo, you have competition as one of your strengths. I do. Absolutely. Are you someone who looks for areas of agreement? Yeah, sometimes. We have more people with command than harmony in here, I've noticed. All right? So maybe you have harmony as a strength. Are you someone who's willing to go with the flow? All right? Good. So adaptability could be your strength. Someone who's always doing, doing, doing. All right? Good. The other good thing about all the hands I'm seeing is a lot of these strengths will really help you in your college career. So that's good if you're someone who's doing, doing, doing. You're an achiever. Are you someone, and this is me, are you pushing the elevator button to remind the elevator that you're there? All right? <laughs> So but we might call you activators, right? You're someone who's an activator. And then are you someone who's always figuring out the plot of a movie before everyone else? And this is one for me I alluded to earlier. Maybe you have a, a strategic strength. Are you someone who's generous with your praise? This is a good one. If you're working on team projects, the students in here, you always want someone with positivity on your team because when things go south, Always good to have someone with positivity. So I'm hoping that um, in kind of walking through that, you know, some, somewhat silly exercise that you start to realize the way you describe strengths, maybe it should be different than what you would have done previously where you say something like writing or math 
Because you can apply a strength like competition or positivity or harmony to any of those things that I would classify as skills or tasks. So if you really figure out where your passions lie, you can, I'm, I mentioned I'm an introverted person, so I can apply my strengths to public speaking engagements or to teaching large classes, and it's really just changed my entire outlook on life and, and on career development. How am I doing on time? I forgot to start a timer, Gary. I'm okay. All right. So I want to, I want to tell you a few ways, uh, and I, I alluded to some of these earlier, but some ways, some clues to your talents, because um, every day someone's not going to present you with a bulleted list and ask you to stand up to identify something as a strength or not. So I mentioned the journal or diary, uh, something, what's really important about this, if you're going to track on your phone, this is something that energized me, this is something that drained me, be very specific about what that task looked like and do it in the moment or as close to the moment as you possibly can because you'll be able to add a lot of rich details and I think that if you're working in a job, taking classes, uh, whatever situation you're in right now, playing soccer, whatever it is, you start making a list, you're going to have awesome answers when you go to job interviews when they ask you questions like what are your strengths? You're going to be very descriptive and you'll find that most people, college graduates, go into job interviews and they say I'm a numbers person, right? I'm good with people. They give very bland answers. But if you get very descriptive about your strengths and they can tell that you've cultivated this and put thought into it and you're very deliberate in your answer, then you're just going to stand out uh, amongst the crowd. So, so be very, uh, d very intentional about keeping uh, details regarding your strengths and how you've applied them at, at school and in your work life. Uh, another thing is that flow state when you're completely absorbed in the activity. This is a great way to ident identify strength. I think my biggest problem in college would have been uh, flow state for me was like playing NHL hockey video games. So I, I might have had to go a little bit deeper than that. But, uh, but try to think about that. When are you just kind of mindlessly pursuing an activity? For me, when I'm reading uh, research in the field of marketing, I just lose myself. And sometimes I'm like, oh, I have to go back and take notes on that, which uh, I wouldn't have expected before I started thinking about these, these types of ideas. And then finally, you can take assessments. So if this is hard for you, I think as a student, you could take the Clifton Strengths Finder assessment for maybe 10 or 15 bucks. And one thing that helps with is the language of strengths. So if you, you kind of know where your passions are, but you're having trouble articulating it or describing it to someone in a job interview, this can give you a lot of clues into you know, how you should be describing activities and mapping them to things that you're doing at school and doing in your work life. So um, I encourage you to, to not just leave with the ideas, but actually leave and try to, try to implement this stuff in, in your daily life, or at least spend a week on it. And then finally, I'll talk briefly about applying this stuff to your personal brand, which is kind of the overarching theme tonight. Uh, so, so one thing from the, the branding world, and James, maybe you can uh, correct me when you come up here as the real branding expert, is that uh, we have these associative memory maps, ways that we think about brands. So if I yell out to you, Coca-Cola, you're going to have some immediate reaction to that. And what do you first think of if I say Coca-Cola? What word pops into your head? What is it? Red? Yeah, Red's a good one. I mean, they, they've made a lot of money on red. You're walking down the soda aisle at the supermarket, you see a flash of red out of the corner of your eye, that's Coca-Cola. You're driving down the freeway, you see a flash of red, it's a Coca-Cola billboard, right? Red is a good one, right? Sweet, polar bears, Santa Claus, you know, whatever it is, we have some immediate associations with Coca-Cola. It's the same way for you. And the nice thing about knowing your strengths is that you can start to help people redevelop or develop their memory maps for you. Because the biggest problem we have in job interviews, and this is kind of an empty Coca-Cola map, um, but I, I want to encourage you that, that you can do this for yourself, is that you know, a recruiter, someone will, will interview 20 people, and you're lucky if they remember maybe your name and a little bit about what you looked like. But if you can tell very memorable stories that are related to your strengths, then you're giving them something that's very positive, very salient, 
and they're going to they're going to remember you above everybody else that they interviewed so just spend some time crafting your personal stories about hey these are my strengths these are how i applied them at work then they'll ask about your weaknesses and you can talk about the shadow side of those strengths you know it's kind of putting the the positive spin on the the weaknesses question but always be thinking about how can i tell a story with this instead of just giving an interviewer a, a bulleted item and, I, and that can be really effective the last thing I would encourage you to do with, uh, with your strengths is to, and I hate to turn this into a marketing lecture, but sit down and we think about SWOT analysis as a tool that we use for brands. Do this for yourself, and I'm serious about this, and Cleo will say the same thing. You, and this is a snapshot. This is something that's going to change all the time for you, but just document. These are my strengths and weaknesses today as I understand them, and it's even better if you can get input from people who know you really well because they can help especially build out that weaknesses section. Right? Get your strengths and weaknesses and think about how are you going to match these to the opportunities and threats that are in the world around you. And this is very important when you're on the job market. So you have this long list of, of things that are threatening your career, opportunities in your career, and you don't really know how to face them. The most powerful thing you can do is figure out, hey, how can I match those, my strengths to these opportunities? And then your job interview is done for you, because that's everything you're going to have to talk about. And when you're at work and you're thinking, gosh, this is a tough problem. This is something that it's draining for me. It's really you know, wearing me down using my weaknesses. The number one thing we do as brands when we have a weakness is partner with somebody else who's strong where we're weak. You can do the same thing. So when you're developing your, your student teams for projects or when you're building teams at work, find people who, who, are strong, who are strong where you're weak. And you're probably strong where they're weak. And you just want to know, you know, where are my shoulders the, the broadest when times get really tough? And, and you, you want to know that about other people too. And, and doing the SWOT analysis just gives you this really helpful snapshot. So I encourage you to document your personal strengths and weaknesses. Think about how can I use these in the, in the real world. And this is, this is such a common model in marketing that if you just Google SWOT analysis, you'll find this no problem. And just, just think about applying it to yourself. Apply it to social media, right? LinkedIn, Cleo mentioned LinkedIn is really my passion. I tried to build out my entire LinkedIn profile based on my strengths. I can craft the message that I want people to see when they search for me on Google. I have a really common name, but it's easy to find my LinkedIn account. So I want that to be a story about my strengths journey, and I don't want it to be a story about my remedial math classes in eighth grade. Right? <laughs> and then some closing thoughts. I really want to leave you with this idea that weakness fixing just prevents failure. Right? It's kind of the bare minimum. We all have to fix weaknesses to a certain extent. Don't spend 90% of your day working on your weaknesses. It's frustrating. It's unfulfilling. It has very marginal returns after a certain point. Instead, work on strengths building because that's what's going to build success. And as we know, happiness is what's underlying that success. And then finally, I love this quote from Tom Rath. You cannot be anything you want to be, but you can be a lot more of who you already are. And I would add to that if you know your strengths. All right. All right thank you very much. I appreciate you. Scott did a great job, didn't he? I tell you what, for a, um, it's a great partnering with this, this, this gentleman. Uh, he's, he's brilliant. Our marketing classes and the MBA uh, program at University of Houston are fantastic because of Scott and his wonderful mind. I will share one thing. Uh, Scott is a marketing guy, but he's also a tech guy. And he worked at Disney. And this is the brilliance of some of the people that you have the opportunity to engage in. Uh, Scott basically developed, you go ahead and tell him. Oh, the, you must be talking about the, yeah. the first mobile websites for Walt Disney World, for all the theme parks. That's pretty huge. That's huge. Give him a hand for that one. But I didn't like IT. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So thank you. Thanks, Scott. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, as I talk about, you know, just what we're about here tonight is really bringing in some extraordinary people and their experiences and sharing with you. And hopefully that is going to, some of these things are going to resonate. Everybody here on the stage uh, have great success stories and experiences. And it's time to introduce uh, someone I've known for a while, uh, Corrine Sweeney. Corrine Sweeney is president of the largest law firm in Iowa. This law firm is uh, over 100 years old, and she is their first president. 
I think that's huge. I think she, that deserves applause. She's going to come up here and talk to you about knowing your audience. And without any further ado, my friend, good friend, Corrine Sweeney, please. I might have heard you wrong, but I thought you said I was the first president of this 100-year facility. I, yeah, I'm not 100 years old. <laughs> Let's just get that straight right away. <laughs> All right. Well, welcome, everybody, and thank you for the, the, the kind intro. Um, I'm going to talk to you tonight about knowing your audience. And, um, but first off, a little bit about me. I uh, uh, was a farm kid. I grew up in Osage, Iowa, uh, northeast Iowa, and oldest of six kids. And um, when I was growing up, I decided um, I, I liked mystery stories. Nancy Drew was a fan of mine and because she figured things out. And I, I kind of equated that to being a lawyer. And so from the fourth grade on, I decided that, that's, that's kind of what I, I want to do. Um, and so in my practice um, as, as a lawyer, when I finally uh, grew up to be one, um, I got into uh, the area of litigation and I became a trial lawyer. And the other aspect of my practice involves mediation. And so I've been trained as a mediator uh, where uh, parties might call me uh, to mediate a piece of litigation uh, that, uh, and they're fighting about some issue and, and it allows me to bring the parties together and work out their differences, hopefully. Um, so in, in those two roles as a trial attorney um, or a, a mediator, um, you have to kind of try to figure out um, uh, how to, you know, figure out how people and then figure out how they tick. And, and um, once I, I'm able to figure that out, that's, that's really when I, I do my best work. So as an attorney, my measure of success is how well can I get people to talk to me? Um, and so I frequently do have to figure out who my audience is. And, and frankly, Anybody in this room has an audience, whether it's in your job in sales, whether it's your job in IT, um, you're, you're constantly um, dealing with an audience. And it might be the customer that you're selling to. Um, it might be um, your audience as an IT person. Um, it, you know, it, when I call the help desk for IT, <laughs> not everybody can explain to me what is going on with my computer. And so those are the kinds of things that, that you're going to be presented with in not only interviews, um, but also the real um, world experiences in front of you. So how do you break through the barriers? Um, you get to know your audience. And so one of the strategies, I'll lay out, lay out a few strategies for us tonight. Um, one of those is is determine what are our generational differences, and so the obvious might be, you know, we hear about Gen Xers, we hear about baby boomers, we hear about millennials, um, and it, it, those are those are, you know, big um, uh, common terms, but but what are they really? And as I think about my past, I I was a kid that played baseball a lot. Um, I played with my brothers and sisters and, and my, my neighbors, so I'll use a little baseball analogy for this. So the baby boomers, they're the kid on third base. They went all the way, almost all the way around the diamond. They're on third base. They've, they've built companies. They've worked hard. They've um, had a significant impact on, on our economy. And um, they start to, at this age, start to talk about rainbows and unicorns. And I think, I don't know if any of you saw it, I, Cleo rode a unicorn in tonight. <laughs> he was out in the parking lot, I saw it. That's right, that's right. On a rainbow. <laughs> so that's our baby boomer at third base. Um, and then we have our millennials. Uh, probably have a few of those in our audience tonight. 
Um, some, some millennials are thought of to have gotten more help from their parents than the generation before. Um, and so we've got the little baseball guy up here getting a little help from, from his <coughs> dad on the sidelines. Um, and, and they're from parents who don't want to have their kids make those same mistakes. These people are confident, they're ambitious, uh, they're very achievement oriented. And so those are the characteristics of some of our millennials out there. Um, and then we have these Gen Xers, the ones that are in between. And, and so this is the kid that maybe has the baseball game, but his parents forgot. And so the kid jumps on his bike, he has a flat tire, he's changing it, the car goes by, splashes mud on him, he finally gets to the game, he's too late, nobody's going to let him play. That's our Gen Xer. <laughs> and so they're frequently uh, described as uh, maybe disaffected, a little directionalist, but happy and hopefully achieving a, a work-life balance. So. Can we, can we stereotype these people? No, of course not, of course not. But let me give you an example um, uh, of a, a story of a, a gal that um, was a colleague of mine uh, back in the day. And so she, she was a bright student, bright accounting student, um, had a great resume. Uh, she went into um, an interview at one of the big accounting firms in Des Moines and um, got home, felt good about it. A week later, she gets a flush letter. And they say, thanks, but no thanks. We, didn't, we aren't interested. And she, and she was crushed because she had this fantastic resume. She had great experience. And so she called uh, the person up and said, oh, why didn't I get this job? And the person said um, that interviewed her said, well, yeah, your resume was good, but um, you giggle the whole time in the interview. And I, I will say that my, my friend did have this sort of nervous laughter that, that when she responded, she did kind of have this, this giggle to her. And she said, um, and so they said, well, you know, when you giggled, it made us feel like you just weren't serious about this job. And so the impression she left with them was completely opposite of what she felt. And, and so, you know, perhaps the, more, the moral of the story is um, I'm, I'm more than what you see. And so thank goodness she had the foresight and the wherewithal to call and say, hey, listen, this is not, this is not the giggling girl. I, I really want this job. So um, they took a chance on her. She became wildly successful. She was a, uh, a brilliant accountant, a, a CPA. She got um, snatched up by um, uh, a, a global insurance company. She went on to march up to being a CFO in this company. At, and in her late 40s, um, she uh, retired wildly rich <laughs> and and it's all because she stood up for herself and said hey I, I I'm gonna take this job seriously but kind of the point of the story is um, uh, number one under, understand your audience and how they're judging you and and maybe somebody her her own age her own um, generation would not have seen those things that this interviewer did um, when they um, when they interviewed her so, digging deeper, strategy two, always be elegant and calm. And I mean this for both men and women. Um, I can think back to a, a, a partner, a mentor of mine that when I was getting um, my first years of experience under my belt, and there was a gentleman in our office, one of the partners, who was extremely articulate and he was always the consummate gentleman. And I'll tell you what, when he walked into a courtroom, people paid attention to him. And he was kind to people and, um, uh, and, and smart. And, and so if you can have that presence and that elegance and that calmness about you, it gets you a long, a long ways in life. Um, in my job, I'm uh, uh, typically called upon to take depositions 
And so I'm in a litigation practice and, and my clients will ask me to go out and depose people. And so that means I'm uh, asking them questions usually about their claims, um, what, what's the nature of their lawsuit. And you better believe I get people that come to me that are from all walks of life and from all different circumstances. And so, again, um, I have to know my audience in that regard and, and figure out what's making them tick. Um, are they coming into me stressed? Um, do they have a wall up? Are they angry? Are they um, scared? Um, all those things are valid feelings that you might get in a, in a litigation setting. And, and so it's, it's my job to kind of start dissecting that. Um, if they're, they're stressed, ask them some really easy questions to kind of, you know, break the ice and warm them up. If they're afraid, explain the process. Tell them what to expect, um, what's going to happen that day. Um, they're probably not going to trust me because, of course, I represent the bad guy that, that they're suing. So endear them. Get them to trust me um, because the more that they can open up, um, it's good for them, they can it, it articulate their claim, and it's good for me because I can then go back and report to my client about what kind of case we have. And if I don't get that information, we're going to walk into a jury and, and have somebody just pummel us because we didn't know our case. So it's important to understand who you're dealing with, and, and you're going to get that in, in, in any, any job that you pursue. You've got people that you work with that are colleagues. You've got customers. Um, you've got management that you speak to. So completely, you have to understand who, who it is that is sitting on the other side of the fence. All right. So this must be the soccer group. Yes. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> um, Balancing the scales um, is another strategy um, tip. And what I mean by this is, is um, ag again, you may come into meetings um, where there's maybe a power play or a, a person in, in a meeting at a different level than you. Um, again, you're going to have to learn to to balance the scales um, so that people can communicate uh, with each other. Um, and, and you may be that person that, that's taking control of the situation. Um, it might be a situation where, like for me, if I'm uh, deposing somebody that's been injured in the workplace, and um, I might say to them, um, I, I know you hurt your back, um, but I don't know anything about this job you do as a mechanic in this manufacturing facility. Take me through uh, a life and a day of this job that you do as a maintenance worker. Tell me, explain to me how, um, uh, how you use the tools that you use. What's the lifting that you do? And because I've never done this job, explain to it. Explain it to me. And so that, I think it gets them to start trusting you and understanding um, the process because we can all talk about what we do in our daily lives. Um, okay, and then strategy four. It's not all about me. Listening, listening carefully um, is really a key, a key element in, in learning your audience and who they might be. Um, the uh, uh, one example I have is my, my niece uh, had an internship this, this past summer and she had a roommate that was working at a, a different company and, and um, she was, and she's a little bit older, she's been out of school and, and so she um, uh, w had been accustomed to working at home. And so when my niece had this fantastic experience with this company over the summer, uh, the roommate decided, well, she would go interview and, and see if she could get a job there. But she really liked working at home. And so what, what, she, what she relayed to my niece was that um, uh, she went in there, asked questions about the job, and said, um, can I work from home? Well. 
that was a question that completely set the the interviewer off because to them that felt like oh you aren't even going to want to work you're showing up for an interview and you don't even want to work and maybe the better question is tell me about your work environment does your company benefit from employees working at home describe your your successful employees in the workplace and so those are better approaches um, to getting the answer to the question that, that you really need to know. Okay. And so digging deeper, strategy five, let's um, again listen more, talk less. A lot of times people want to come in and they just want to tell their story. So let them. Uh, you, you can't learn anything when you're running your mouth um, and when you're doing all the talking and telling. Uh, so, you know, dig deeper, listen more, talk less. Um, and then finally, um, there's a really smart dude by the name of Aristotle. Um, I'll leave this quote with you. The fool tells me his reasons, the wise man persuades me with my own. Everybody has a story to tell or a product to sell. Know your, audi your audience before you open your mouth. Thank you. All right, folks, you, um, Karine's did a, did a great job. As we set up the, this framework for you to help you in your careers, help you in school and, of course, after school. It's nice to get this information early. So Scott talked about knowing your strengths. Corrine just went through a, a very good uh, process of and really reiterating why you need to know your audience. Uh, the next presenter is going to talk about knowing your brand. James Herring uh, works for the Richards Group. And the Richards Group is one of the top advertising agencies in the country. Uh, by the way, anybody here fans of Chick-fil-A? Uh, and, and what do you know about Chick-fil-A? What what's most memorable about them? Eat more chicken? And who's representing the, uh, and who's giving that message? What type of animal? Cows. The richest group created that campaign. And the gentleman that's part of it is getting ready to speak to you right now. Give James Herring a big round of applause. All right, um, bringing in the home stretch. Um, what I'm going to kind of, whoop, that was the end. I'm done. Okay. Oh. Bye. <laughs> Wasn't that captivating and amazing? <laughs> I really. I can help you with that. Uh, no. with my boomer skills. I yeah. Can do that, so. <laughs> no, that's all right. You like that. That's all right. <laughs> I probably messed you up by starting it at the same at the end, so we're all good. Anyway, again, my name is James Herring, uh, based in Dallas, Texas. Uh, I was actually born in Wichita, Kansas. Uh, my dad worked for Procter & Gamble. We moved around in every single small town in the middle of America till we landed in, in Lubbock. Grew up there, uh, went to Texas Tech University, actually got a degree in advertising, and I uh, wanted to kind of pursue my dreams of, of working in an ad agency. Um, but that was just a brief 32 years ago. And guess what? A lot has changed in the world of marketing and communications. Um, but one area that's been really paramount and a lot of companies and a lot of brands have really hyper-focused on is this notion of branding. And it's a very, very important discipline. It's something that when done really, really well allows a company to really thrive. But I thought, you know, um, when Cleo first called me up, he said, you know, we were going to do this TED Talk thing. And I thought, awesome. I love those TED Talks. I mean, how many, how many people have seen a TED Talk on, yeah, totally awesome. I thought it was very applicable, but I thought to myself, you know, this is not just a TED Talk. I mean, we got Cleo here. I think we need to have a Cleo chat. I think it was much more <laughs> applicable for the branding here. I like that, right? So anyway, let's kind of move on. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Know Your Brand. I'm going to break it up in kind of five quick sections. I'm, I'm actually going to talk a little bit about what exactly is a brand. Um, 
why you need to create and manage your own personal brand. Um, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time asking some soul searching questions about your digital presence. Very important. Um, and I also spend a little bit of time capitalizing on some of your prior experience as you start to think about marketing yourselves and getting prepared for you know, getting into the workforce. And then I'll finally kind of wrap it up with some key lessons that I've learned along the way that I just want to kind of share with you. So let's go ahead and dive in. So the first thing I wanted to talk about, you know, at the Richards Group, here's our really amazing building that our founder, Stan Richards, designed and built. Again, based in Dallas, Texas, we have the good fortune to work with a lot of really incredible companies. Brands like The Home Depot or Ram Trucks, uh, Dr. Pepper and Snapple. Um, anybody use a Keurig machine? Yeah, those things are crack, are they not? Okay, it's pots, <laughs> but they really are. You can't start your day without one. Um, anyway, a lot of really, really amazing brands. Now, not every brand started off being really incredible. A lot of them took a lot of discipline in order to not just sell stuff, move products, deliver services, but also the way we think about branding in today's world is it's not just what you are um, selling today, but it's what you hope to be able to sell tomorrow and connect with over and over and over again. So let me talk a little bit about, you know, there's a few of our clients, my little NASCAR slide, but let's dive into it. What really is a brand? Because I think a lot of people hear that phrase and they think, oh, yeah, I like branding. That's pretty cool stuff, like Nike. Just do it. That's a really amazing brand. And yeah, it really, really is. It's a hallmark example of doing really incredible branding. But I will tell you this. We look at branding a little bit differently because a brand is not a name, a logo, a person, it's not an organization, it's not a tagline, and it's not an ad campaign. Oh, wait a minute, James, you just talk about all those amazing brands that do all this cool stuff with taglines and celebrities and the whole mix. Well, that is not what a brand is about, okay? A brand is actually a promise. It is a promise made by an organization to a customer group that says we are going to do this we're going to stand for this we're going to provide this we're going to serve you in this way that is the promise that they set forth and when a brand delivers up on that they can be phenomenally successful but when a brand breaks a promise what happens you lose faith don't you you don't use that product anymore well, guess what, friends? The competition is one click or tap away in the digital world. And brand loyalty, whew, kind of an all-time low. In fact, when you think about our affinity with institutions today, be it government, be it faith, be it corporate entities, our brand loyalty to those organizations and entities has really gone to an all-time low. A lot of people out there breaking a lot of promises, but there are brands that do a really good job of keeping those promises. So what does that promise entail? Well, we like to think of brand promises as being something that's simple, clear, and memorable, okay? And it also has to be relevant and differentiating. And I lay those things out because I want you to start, as I'm going through this, start to think a little bit about the relevancy to yourself, okay? And as you are starting to position how you were going to go about getting a job, it's really important to think about how am I going to make sure my personal brand is simple, clear, and memorable when I go into the job interview and clearly communicate why it is that you should hire me. Is the messaging that I'm communicating in my resume or on my LinkedIn page unique and differentiating? Those are things that are really, really important. Now, branding is not just a fluffy fun, artsy, creative thing that I get to do at work, ideating and coming up with fun campaign things. It is a tangible benefit to businesses. In fact, it is 20% of a brand's market share. Brand value, a key component of intangible value, represents on average 20% of a company's market cap. So anybody notice, heard about the news that Amazon keeps tipping over $1 trillion in market capitalization? 
Okay? What's 20% of that? $200 billion is just the value of Amazon and Amazon Prime alone. That's a lot of money. That's a pretty powerful brand, right? Uh, another key fact for you. Uh, brands, strong brands, are far more likely to grow in market share in the next 12 months. And they have a four times greater odd of actually uh, greater odds than weak brands have of growing. So strong brands end up succeeding in the marketplace. Weak or average brands kind of linger. So another fact for you, brands that consumers say have a strong brand proposition and excellent advertising, they grew 168% in brand value over the past 10 years as opposed to their competition. So guess what, folks? I'm going to kind of lay it down tonight. Branding matters. And branding really matters for you personally. Okay? So why do you need to create and manage your own personal brand? Why is it so important in today's age? I mean, you're going to hopefully graduate, get that degree, go out into the marketplace, right? Okay? And you're going to end up being one of about 29 or so percent of the adult U.S. population that's got a four-year degree. That's a pretty amazing accomplishment. Shouldn't that just automatically get my job? Right? Eh, I wish that that was the case. All right. Let me give you a little bit of a historical perspective, and I like to call it back in the good old days, just a short 20, 25 years ago. Here's what would happen. You graduate. You would go either in the newspaper or look at the classifieds. You would find a list of jobs, and you would find a company that you want to work for. Maybe your friend knows somebody, but anyway, you go. And you get the job. You start. You're working. And then a couple of years go by, five years go by, ten years go by. You're working your way up the ladder. You're working really, really hard, right? And eventually you might achieve that really cool position in the company. And suddenly 15 years have gone by. And then you end up finishing up your career at that same company and you get to retire. That guy's a little tired. He's kind of leaning over I'm trying to get out of the building. But 30 years have gone by and you've worked with this one same company. This was kind of the old, unspoken sort of um, trust that employers and employees had with companies. Well, guess what? Those days are completely gone. I mean, if you did finish up, maybe they would even give you, you know, a really cool gold watch, which was meant to commemorate all the time that you spent slaving away working for that company. So. <clears throat> Those days are completely gone. No longer <coughs> do companies keep employees. In fact, you are an asset on a balance sheet. And if you lose your voice, you might get fired. No. Um, <coughs> you end up, really, quite frankly, a, a company looks at employees and employees' costs in all reality as another asset that they have. It may be a factory, it may be tooling, it may be resources, et cetera, et cetera. And if we happen to have a downturn in the economy and they need to downsize, guess what? They strategically think about who may or may not stay with the company. And it's just a reality, okay? Uh, the saying goes is that the assets go down the elevator shaft every single night, and that's the employees that are working in a company. So what do you got to do to maybe rethink that dynamic? Well. Let's kind of look at some key stats here. Um, when you think about your personal brand, um, we want to think about kind of positioning you. And if you've done any marketing classes um, and study kind of positioning as a concept, um, we think about the question, how do we want our brand to exist in the mind of our target audience? Where is its relevant place, okay? And it's really kind of a classic three-part marketing kind of statement, um, and it goes like this, very simple formula, to the target audience, brand X, generic brand for the moment, is within a competitive set, and it is the entity that is what is the most compelling benefit. So I'll, I'll make this tangible and, and, and real. So for over 30 years, our companies had the good fortune to work with a hotel chain. Now this hotel chain, when they first came to us, um, we went out on the west coast and we did some site visits and we got back to the agency and we're an advertising agency, okay? So our very first recommendation to the company was, 
do not advertise. Do not advertise. Why? Their product was terrible. We had to really convey the news to this ownership group that the brand that they had acquired was terrible. It was a discount hotel chain. Um, you had to put quarters into the TV to make the TV run for 10 minutes. You had to go down the hall to use the pay phone that was mounted on the wall. Um, mattresses were a little suspect. It was just not a really good product. They said, okay, we get it, we get it. Look, you're right, we don't want to advertise. And guess what? We're on a mission, and right now we're investing millions of dollars to completely revamp the product. Because quite frankly, we just won this ad account, and we thought, man, did we get a dog. Well, fortunately, they filled us in that they were going to slowly roll across the country and fix all of these locations and really improve them and make them really, really nice. So we're excited about it. But what we quickly kind of realized after doing a lot of marketplace research is this brand um, actually had a pretty loyal following. But we would go into a focus group, and these people were all recruited. They had actually stayed at this hotel. And we, the moderator would get in there, and he would say, okay, um, what hotels have you guys stayed with lately? And some people would say Best Western, or maybe Days Inn, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But they never said the brand. So the focus group moderator is kind of freaking out, going, wait a minute, we recruited these people, but nobody's here saying that they actually admit they stay at the brand. Well, the reality is, after probing once, twice, three times, finally somebody would say, you know, if I'm out traveling, maybe it's a trip, um, you know, I'll, I'll stay at Motel 6 because maybe I can save some extra money to, to bring home a gift for the grandkids. So yeah, it'll help me get an extra tank of gas as a sales guy. I need that for my week. So it blew us away that these people would not admit that they actually would stay at a Motel 6. And when we really began to unpack it, we understood the fact that it wasn't that they were ashamed or that they weren't poor, but that the common denominator across all of the participants was they actually just wanted to save money. And we started to think it through, and it wasn't that, they, again, they were cheap or poor, it's that we understood they were just frugal. They liked to hold on to their hard-earned money. So I'll share the brand positioning for Motel 6 so you get a, kind of a sense of what it's like. So their positioning is to frugal people. That's kind of their description of who they are. Motel 6 is the comfortable place to stay. Now that's their kind of, kind of competitive set. Now we could have said is a really wonderful discount hotel chain, but we also discovered the fact that their competition was not just a hotel, but it could be my friend's couch that I want to crash on, or it could be Aunt Millie's spare bedroom, or it could be a trucker who's got a rig and he could pull over for the night and stay there. Our goal was to broaden the sense of the kind of competitive set to be all encompassing. And then to kind of wrap things up, their most unique compelling benefit was the fact that they were always going to be the lowest national chain. And if you notice a Motel 6, they literally have a digital pricing sign outside every single location. And if Best Western across the street drops their rate, the guy goes online and changes the price, and it's always the lowest chain. So that's their, that's their approach. And um, over the course of 30 years, in keeping one consistent communication campaign. If I walk out on the street today, over 95% of the people that I would talk to, if I were to say Motel 6, they would say back to me, oh yeah, we'll leave the light on for you. Or Tom Bodette, the guy who narrates the spots, if you've heard them. So that's a story of the power of, of branding and being able to kind of position things the right way. So if we do that, here's my friend, Brandon Raspberry, literally, um, coming out of college, and we had a conversation. We sat down, we talked about, what do I gotta do to stand out in today's marketing world? And we started having a conversation about his positioning and how does he stand out? So for Brandon, his positioning is, his target audience are hiring managers accounting firm because he got an accounting degree but he is that entry-level job candidate. That's sort of his frame of reference or his competitive set. But his unique 
value proposition is he's the guy that promises a lot and delivers more. If you know Brandon like I do, he will never give up ever on anything that he does in his life. That's his MO. If it's a really challenging school project or a difficult boss, or maybe he's got to fix his car, Brandon never really gives up. So that's kind of his kind of unique, compelling benefit. So how do you mark, perhaps start to think about it for your own individual self? Well, let's unpack that for a little bit. You know, ask yourself, what is it that you're gonna promise? when you land that first job. It's not a question of getting the interview and getting the job, but what the heck are you gonna do once you actually start to perform that job? What is the unique aspect about you that you can offer as a value proposition? I'm not talking about skills or talents or education or whatever. What's inside you that you're gonna to bring to the table? Are you gonna outwork, outsmart, out hustle? What is it that you're gonna do? What's that one word or phrase that you can think of that best describes you? And you can actually do your own proprietary research. You can talk to your friends and family and ask them a simple question. You know, when you think about me, what's the one thing that comes to mind? Just ask them that question. You'd be amazed at what you'll get back in terms of feedback. Ask your friends. Could be some interesting feedback that you get, right? Okay, so I wanna talk a little bit about your digital presence because it profoundly impacts your personal brand, okay? So, uh, how many people have been asked this question or told this of late? Raise your hand if you've been told you need to take a look at your social media presence and maybe clean it up. Nobody? Come on. Yeah. Uh -huh, uh -huh. yeah. Um, I can't tell you how critically important it is for you to really consciously do this. And I'll tell you why. We will find a fabulous candidate. And by the way, at the Richards Group, we receive on average every single day between 150 and 200 resumes. I said every single day. There's only 741 positions in the whole company. So think about that. What is the one thing we, we look at the resume, we look at the really well-written cover letter, great experience, excellent academic performance. The very first thing we do, we check and check and check because it is a amazing reflection of who you are and what you've done within the digital landscape, especially your social media profiles. And let me tell you, the fastest way to get taken out of contention is you know, getting that thumbs up or thumbs down are some questionable stuff that's in your digital past. So public service announcement, do that. Clean it up, make sure there's things that don't Put you in a questionable light. Um, the other thing is, and we've already kind of talked about this a little bit, is um, LinkedIn really is now the corporate portal to understanding the talent base of America. Um, really amazing site. I was fortunate enough to accidentally stumble upon it and sign up for it uh, many, many years ago, and it's been an incredible resource for me. But I instantly, after I look at that resume, and then we go through their social media check profile, the very next thing I do is I look at their LinkedIn re uh, profile. And I ask myself, is this person representing himself well in the digital space? Now, how many people have started a LinkedIn profile? Okay. When's the last time you've looked at your LinkedIn profile? Yeah, it's been a little while. Okay, don't fret. Here is the Cliff Notes way to get a really amazing LinkedIn profile. Are you ready? First thing you want to do is, um, I mentioned clean up your accounts, right? Um, polish and, fine, and, and refine that resume and finalize it and make it truly, truly amazing. If you've crafted your resume and you have not shared it with a minimum of 10 people to get their POV and input on what you've done, you really haven't finished your resume. And obviously it's the basic stuff of ensuring every single thing is spell checked and designed and it looks great, but make sure that you expose it to enough people do you get some perspective on how it looked. But once you've got your resume polished, it's fantastic content to feed directly into LinkedIn. It's super simple. It's literally cut and paste, okay? Because it is a reflection of your experience. Now, Within LinkedIn, there are a lot of other fabulous content modules that allow you to say, for instance, post three or four examples of some of your really amazing student projects. Uh, maybe you had individual um, elements like artwork or 
writing examples, um, a video clip of you winning, you know, I don't know, a sports competition, whatever that is, that's a repository for you to be able to tell the world about who you are and your accomplishments. So take advantage of it because I guarantee you the world is looking at you through your LinkedIn presence, okay? So um, add examples of products. <clears throat> and then if you're kind of on the creative side and you need an online portfolio, the one thing I tell people is don't fret trying to create a custom coded um, original from scratch website to house examples of your work. Um, you don't need to do that. Just go to a content management site like a, um, a Squarespace or a number of other sites and use one of their templates to put your creative work or examples of your work product that you've done you know, from your academic career. It, it literally takes 10 minutes to set one of those up, pick a profile, add your work, boom, you've got an online portfolio, okay? Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about another type of area that uh, is related to helping kind of craft your story and your brand. Um, I had a really engaging conversation with a client and we were sitting around talking about because he had been getting a lot of questions from people who were saying, you know, as I work through school, and this guy was um, in finance, he said, you know, I had a lot of oddball jobs. And the question always came up, do I put those oddball jobs on my resume? They look kind of weird. They're not relevant to that category. Is it a bunch of nonsense? And we started thinking about, you know, that's actually a common challenge that a lot of people have. A lot of people, I mean, how many people have jobs and work through school? You know, it's pretty prevalent. So a lot of times those jobs and careers can seem a little disconnected, but I'll show you a path of how you can take advantage of it. And that is think about not what you are doing, but what it is that you learned from those experiences, but because it can weave a story about who you are and how you can be successful in the workplace. So, um, with that, this is from 1969, my little collection bag from being a paper boy in Lubbock, Texas. I had 26 customers, and this is what I carried around to collect the money for the monthly subscriptions, okay? Now, six years old, being a paper boy. Now, is that job really all about being a paper boy? No. My first, it was my first true job in the advertising and media industry. I was an entrepreneur at an early age. Here's another example. Uh, I had a small side business where I picked up dog poop. Now some people can say advertising, shoveling dog poop, those are actually closer than you think. I'm kidding. But am I really doing a pooper scooper business or am I an animal health assistant? <laughs> think about it. All right? Here's another example. I made a lot of really good money mowing lawns, you know, pretty easy business to do, make a lot of money in the summer, you know, am I a lawnmower or a landscape entrepreneur? Because it was my own business. I had customers, I had to collect money, I had appointments I had to keep, and I had a reputation as being the best lawn mowing guy out there. Okay, one more. Um, am I a dishwasher? Well, let me tell you, sometimes you're just a dishwasher. Okay, so don't overdo it. Don't overdo it. Okay, not everything you can put a spin on. But anyway, um, part of the fun that we had in this conversation, though, is we talked about all the oddball jobs, and I literally went back and thought about all the things I had to do because I actually paid my own way through college, and I had a lot of oddball jobs. I usually had two or three jobs at a given time. So I ended up making a list. I'm not going to show you how I spun all these, but um, cashier, retail clothing sales clerk. I actually worked in a bowling alley pro shop. We talked about that where I literally drilled holes in bowling balls for the, you know, the fingers. Yeah, there's a job out there for that. Um, I admitted I was a roller rink birthday clown. <laughs> and public for the first time today. Yeah. Uh, his name was Rolo and I had big red hair and a clown suit and a red nose. I admit it. But it was fun. But it was cool because that job allowed me uh, I also worked in an art department and was an apartment retail uh, rental assistant. I actually I shared with these guys today, um, when I, uh, later part of high school and getting into college, um, I wanted wheels, I wanted a car. But I didn't necessarily have tons of extra money to get a car. But one thing I figured out was there was a demand for good quality used cars, so I would find cars that would be 
mechanically sound but cosmetically challenged. I knew how to wax and polish a car. So I'd buy an automobile, I'd drive it for six or eight months, it would be my ride, but I'd also fix it up, polish it up, sell it, flip it, make 800, 1,000, 1,200 bucks, and that went a long way for gas money and beer money. I mean, and I had a ride. So, and I did this over and over, and I actually sold about 47 or so cars um, while I was in school. Um, and I say all that because, um, you know, a, a lot of times in thinking through and trying to figure out, you know, how do I take something that I need and turn it into a benefit? I think that's a pretty good example. I needed wheels, but I also need another job. So I turned it into a business. Okay. Um, but the role of the clown thing turned into I got an opportunity on Sundays to get up in the DJ booth and spin records, vinyl records, and that then turned into a dance club DJ that paid fabulous money. I got like $20 an hour, which 30 years ago was amazing. So I'm literally, yeah, that kind of DJ. It was really cool. So anyway, so a lot of prior experience that you have done, think back of all the odd jobs and things that you've done in your career. They all ladder up. They all have life lessons. Figure out a clever way to position those to tell a story about who you are. Okay, finally, a few lessons learned along the way. There's little pearls of wisdom, you know, you get them from your parents and your grandparents and it's always awesome to be able to get it from mentors in the business world because it's, it's the little stuff that they didn't tell you about in college that is the real world. Okay, first thing I'll share with you is uh, no one person is more important than another. No one person is more important than another. All right. So um, the CEO of Charles Schwab and Company, Walt Bettinger, extremely successful individual, shared a story about him being in his MBA class. And the professor told him, look, we're going to have an exam at the end of the semester. And it's important that you be highly observational and pay attention to everyone in the room during this course. And then we will have an exam. So the students went through the semester. They tried to pay attention to all the content in the lecture. And at the end of the semester, the test had one question. What was the name of the janitor? See, Olivia had come in and out of the classroom hundreds of times. No one said a single word to her the entire semester. And that really sunk in to Walt the importance of understanding that every single person contributes to society no matter what they do and every single person matters. So everybody flunked, but Walt learned an amazing lesson that he applies every single day to the 35,000 employees of Charles Schwab and Company. So pretty cool. All right, uh, the first job is rarely the perfect job. And I'm here today to tell you that there's going to be a lot of innate stress that you've built up inside yourself to like prove to your parents and everybody else that you landed the most amazing job. Well, guess what? That first job is probably not going to be totally perfect and amazing. But guess what? There's things to learn when you get that job and you get into it. You need to give it a minimum of a couple of years unless it's completely crappy and your boss is insane. You really do need to make a change. But you need to give it your all to give it a try and really understand what it's like to get that first job. But again, it may not be the perfect role for you, and that is okay. There are a lot of opportunities for you to be able to look at other roles, uh, which is directly connected to this thing, and you've heard this thing before, never burn a bridge. And I mean that in all sincerity. I cannot tell you how many times in my career people that I have worked with who's been a peer ends up being my client two years later. And I gotta tell you, there's this guy named Westero, pompous, ornery jerk, who was my kind of peer at the ad agency. And Wes would come into work every single day. The first thing he would do was pop open the newspapers and just read the papers, sit at his desk for two hours while I'm working away. Now, Wes was claiming to be getting, you know, up to speed on information. And I'm sitting here cranking out a bunch of ads. And guess what? Wes finally gets a job at a client. I go, fantastic. And he leaves. Two years later, he was my client. Now, I could have told Wes off about all the work that he skipped out on, but actually he became a pretty good client down the road. So again, never burn a bridge. 
really. Um, I like the saying, if you strive, you thrive. If you bail, you fail. There is no substitute for hard work. And I said this a little bit earlier today, um, but the reality is you can be super smart, have a great pedigree, awesome resume, a lot of great benefits to yourself, but if you don't put in the time to really do the hard work, because there are no shortcuts to success, you may be sort of successful, but you're not gonna realize your full potential. Um, I was talking to these guys a little bit earlier today. In the state of Texas, Texas Tech University is kind of oftentimes in the shadow of University of Texas and Texas A&M and TCU and SMU and Rice and all these other fancy institutions. And we're up here in Lubbock, Texas. Well, I always love the story of hearing from a hiring manager who told me, yeah, I've had a lot of folks from all those different schools and they're all pretty cool, pretty smart, but the one thing I could always count on a, on a hire from Texas Tech is they will always outwork everybody else. And it's just that notion of kind of the West Texas way and work ethic that we were born with is really important. Okay, number five. Am I good on time? Right. Roll, rolling it in, bringing it home? Okay. Ooh, one more. Uh, positivity matters. Um, you know, the saying of your attitude helps to determine your altitude. Um, it really does make a difference in terms of how you feel about every single day. Not every day is going to be perfect, but if your coworkers and your boss and your company and the management know that you're somebody that is going to carry forth a positive outlook, and sometimes you got to fake it, but if you carry forth a positive outlook, they are going to view you as someone that they want to entrust with that next big project, someone that they want to be around, someone that they want to promote. And it's really easy, I know, for me to say, gosh, you know, sometimes days are pretty crappy and I'm just gonna be a grump today. It, it can happen. Take a sick day, get it out of your system, come back the next day and be positive. Because it does make a huge difference in terms of how people perceive you short term and long term. Okay. Thank you, girl, we're wrapped up. All done. Excellent. What do you guys think? Good information? Just uh, stand up for a second. Just take a, a quick stand up. Uh, if you need to break here, just a stand up break real quick. I know I need one. <laughs> but you know what? I think there's, uh, it's amazing. Amazing, in fact, that you've heard from some of the best. And I just want to take five minutes and kind of wrap things up pretty quick. And I know you guys have been amazing to come here and I really appreciate what you've done. I'm just gonna talk real quickly about the purpose of this, this foundation very quickly. We're doing one thing, making sure we invest, engage, and do all we can to develop leaders today so you can be better leaders tomorrow. That's the goal of the Franklin Leadership Foundation. You heard about Know Your Strengths? I thought that was an excellent presentation from, from Scott. Always go with your strengths without question and don't spend too much time on your weaknesses. You heard from Corrine talking about knowing your audience. It's not one size at all. If you're looking at a, if you're going to a job interview, get to know who you're, who's interviewing you and also possibly, is it a millennial? Is it a baby boomer? Generation X? Study up on the people before you go in. And of course, uh, knowing your brand, James just talked about, your brand is a promise. And something my grandfather used to always say, make sure your say-do ratio is high. Do what you say you're going to do. And by the way, your brand is not what they say when you're in the room, it's what they say when you leave the room, okay? And when you leave the room, you wanna make sure that what you do and what you're promising, how you position, is gonna represent you. Real quickly, I know those, a very condensed version today about your purpose. I think it's the biggest question. Knowing your strengths, knowing your audience, knowing your brand, but why am I here on earth and what am I here and my meaning? What am I meant to do? What is my purpose? I think that's the question we all ask. If you look at Mother Teresa, 
You look at Gandhi, the example of the change you'd like to see in the world, and of course Martin Luther King, wouldn't we all agree to have purpose? I think we all would. Nelson Mandela, Harriet Tubman, Abraham Lincoln, would you say that they were purpose driven? I think we would say yes. What does the dictionary tell us about purpose? The reason for which something is done or created or from which something exists. I like this one. What is purpose? Mark Twain. The two most important days in your life are the day you are born and the day you find out why. Purpose goes beyond just a position. You're here in school, you're studying, looking for a career. Be a teacher, CEO, an attorney. But it's more than that. It's also more than your achievements, whether or not you're the top seller, top scorer, the leader in, in a course on tackles on the field. And in business, it's going to be more than just selling goods. And when I was in the agricultural business, I like to say trading tractors for dollars. It's more than that. And it's also defined by a different metric. Two quotes and why your purpose goes beyond a position. James Baldwin, great literary giant in our country. We are not obliged to accept the world's definition given to us. That's why you're here. You're here to create the definition in your purpose of who you are, why you're here, and what you're going to do. Clayton Christensen, great Harvard business professor. I love his, his approach to life. He says, do not let your life's pursuits become the consequences of everyone's opinion. Sometimes what people say about us, we take that in. But I'm telling you, do not let that define you. Your purpose speaks to what you love, your passion, your strengths, what you value, what's true to you. It gives you meaning. Quite frankly, your purpose gets you out of bed in the morning whistling. Your purpose also speaks to the person that you are today and the person that you're going to become. I like to define your purpose as how are you living your life? In fact, the reasons for being, which is a Japanese term, kagi, and I'll get into that very quickly. Anna Mahindra, 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 where I worked my last position, I have my own consulting business and work on several board of directors and invest in several companies and entrepreneur. Anand uh, is the CEO of a $25 billion company, over 200,000 employees, over 100 companies in 100 countries. In fact, I'll be publishing a book in about two to three months, and he's going to write the foreword. Man is about 8,000, I'm sorry, 9 million people are following him on Twitter. But this is what he says. Businesses who will dominate the future and be successful will be focused on more than just providing great products, services, and being profit-driven. They will be purpose-driven. The reason why I said that is because it applies to you. Clayton Christensen, your purpose is more than becoming something. It's a state of being and how you live your life. It's more than the level of the performance that you have achieved. It's about the individuals you've helped to become better people. I like his definition. By the way, the path to your purpose is personal. Not only is it personal, it really is defined by what matters most to you. For example, how do you get to nine? There's many ways to get to nine. And how you define your purpose will be different by how you define your purpose. As long as it's what you're interested in and what is your passion. And you stay true to it. Kobe Bryant, rest in peace. Tragic ending, but a life well lived. And this is what I love about Kobe. He had a purpose. A lot of people try to place a purpose upon him when he first came into the league. He said, you know what? You're going to be the next Michael Jordan. Kobe said, no, I only want to be Kobe Bryant. He did not let other people's opinions drive his existence. I shared this with the team earlier in my breakout about a young man that was in a game of his life in the fourth quarter. They were down 10 points. He had already thrown two interceptions and had two fumbles, but yet he led his team to victory. And you know who that guy was. Go Kansas City Chiefs, Patrick Mahomes. And you know what? After the game, he said, Patrick, you're going to be the face of the NFL. What do you think? He goes, you know what? 
There's a lot of great players in the NFL. Even some veterans that are, that are really good. I'm not interested in being the face of the NFL. I just want to be the best Patrick Mahomes I can be. I said he was very focused on his purpose. But how do you begin? Some people would say you begin with the end in mind, which I'm getting there. And I'll tell you, to begin, you have to be a lifelong learner, a lifelong learner. Leonardo da Vinci, I'm still learning at 87. And learning never exhausts the mind. The capacity to learn is unlimited. You just have to be open to it. Speaking of that, keep a beginner's mindset. I love this quote. In a beginner's mind, there are, only, there are many possibilities. In the expert mind, there are few. Never be an expert, because if you're an expert, you're done learning. Always approach life as a beginner. Mark Twain, you have to be open to all possibilities. I love this quote. An open mind leaves a chance for someone to drop a worthwhile thought in it now and then. If your mind is closed, you won't be exposed to new ideas and thoughts. And look at this picture. Two tires and kids. It's amazing. Always feed your imagination. And I love this quote from Albert Einstein. Logic will take you from A to B, but your imagination will take you everywhere. And last but not least, spark goodness wherever you can go. Go out in the world and do well, but more importantly, go out in the world and do good. Here's a construct for your purpose that'll help you. Now, you're not, it's going to take you thinking about this deeply. And this is the Agami model. And you want to be in the middle. You want to really understand your passion, what Scott talked about, your strengths, your purpose, your meaning, what, 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 what drives you. And then, what's your love? But if you know what you're good at and you know what you love, you need to also find a place that really is going to value what you love and what you're good at. And that's what is needed. And last, if you can get value from that. Now, value is not necessarily monetary. But you derive value. But you want to be in the middle. Understand what you love. Understand what you're good at. Try to take those two to a place that has a need for it and for you to receive something in return. That's a GAMI model for a purpose construct. And last, this is my quote. Who you are depends on what you consistently do. And what you do is driven by your purpose. Your purpose is more than achieving a position. I talked about that earlier. It is more than achieving a position. It's how you use your position, no matter where you are, in life to help others become better people, which is the ultimate measure of success. I'm not here to tell you what your purpose is. I'm only here to help you start to think about your purpose. And I would say spend time on that, thinking about that as much as you can throughout your life. And it's never too early to start. And hopefully today, being able to listen to this panel about knowing your strengths, understanding your audience, knowing your brand, and this construct for your purpose has given you four perspectives to help you take where you are today to where you want to be.